While pastoring at another church, we were on the topic of evangelism and part of what we wanted to do was to make sure that people understood their salvation. And so I had my wife in her Sunday school class have the students, little kids, ask other people what it took to go to heaven. How does one go to heaven? If they were to die today, would they go to heaven? And although this church is probably this symbolic of other churches, possibly, some of the questions or the answers that came back were quite surprising. Uh, I'm a good person. Uh, I haven't killed anybody. I do good things. I go to church. I give my money. And uh, those are quite surprising. Uh, and in the eyes of God, those are good things. But that's not necessarily what God is looking for. He's looking for something more than that. I want you to stay tuned for this lesson because we're going to meet a group of people called the Pharisees who had the similar answers or theology that these people in this church had. And we're going to find out what Jesus has to say and we're going to find out what is really important in the eyes of God. Stay tuned. We're going to have a fantastic lesson. We are going to learn a lot. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III, uh, bringing you the Sunday School lesson for the first Sunday in September, September 3rd, 2023. I want to thank you for joining me on the day. Glad to have you with me. The title of our lesson is called Love Completes, Law Falls Short. Love Completes, Law Falls Short. We'll come from the Gospel of Luke the 11th chapter, we will begin with verse 37 and end with verse 44. About Not a lot of verses, but impactful because Jesus is teaching again using uh, illustrations that are fantastic. But before we get started, I want to uh, remind you to hit the like button, hit the share button, hit the subscribe button, share this lesson with many people as you can. And I encourage you to listen to the lesson all the way through for two reasons. One, uh, I believe you'll be blessed by it. Two, uh, it would allow uh, Google and the algorithms to put this message out even farther. So, so while you're driving the car, listen to it. While you're walking, listen to it. Uh, while you're uh, riding a bike, exercising, listen to it. That's, that's what I do, and it helps me out a lot. Thank you in advance. So let's get into this great lesson. I'm excited about it. Uh, Jesus is probably midway through his ministry. Uh, he's done so many good things, so many amazing things. He has healed people. He has uh, cast out demons. He has quieted the storms uh, that with the disciples in the boat. He's done all those things. He's established himself as a phenomenal teacher, teaches with authority. He has uh, becoming apparent that he is just not an ordinary uh, prophet. He is coming apparent that this man is special. Uh, he could be the Messiah that the people are looking for. He has gained so much popularity and so much fame that the Pharisees are becoming jealous. The Pharisees are looking at him closely. They're trying to figure him out. They're not understanding how can this man be so popular? How can he do the things that he's doing? And so, uh, it, you know, oftentimes when you do good things for the Lord, uh, this is God himself, Jesus, uh, you, there are always going to be some type of naysayer. And so as much as Jesus is uh, blessing others and bringing joy to others and healing people, uh, on the same end, there is a crowd, a religious crowd, that just does not like him. In that day, there were three uh, primary, three religious groups. You had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, 
and you had the scribes. The scribes were the lawyers, the Sadducees denied the resurrection, and then you had the Pharisees uh, who were the holier-than-thou people. They followed the uh, law perfectly. They put the emphasis on the oral and written law at the same time ne uh, neglecting the spiritual requirements that God had laid out. Uh, the Pharisees were so intent on following the law perfect, they added over a period of time, they added laws upon laws upon laws upon laws, and they felt that by following the law perfectly, they were uh, earning their righteousness and they were becoming in good uh, standing with God himself. And we're going to find out that is really the opposite. And unfortunately, many of us live today uh, trying to earn our salvation or to earn our right standing with God by doing good things, by keeping a letter of the law, but we neglect what's on the inside, the spiritual requirements. So we're going to find out how Jesus, how God feels about that. So let's get right into this lesson. We're on chapter 11 of the Gospel of Luke. We're looking at verse 37. Um, Jesus has been speaking to the crowds. And so as he gets through speaking, it says, while Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he's finished speaking, coming to a close. And a Pharisee is asking Jesus to dine with him. Why is this Pharisee? who really was a, a antagonistic or opposed to Jesus as a person and to the things that he said, who felt threatened by Jesus, who would not submit to him, why would a Pharisee ask Jesus to dine with him? One, he was curious. Who is this man? How does this man gather all this attention? What's so special about this man? Or maybe what can I find out against this man? So uh, the intention for him asking him to dinner, uh, it was mixed. Maybe it was good out of curiosity, maybe it was bad trying to trap him, but it wasn't uh, in a way that they were willing to follow Jesus or submit to him or to recognize him as the Messiah. So he asked him, we look at here, Pharisee asked him uh, to dine with him. And the Bible says, so he went in and reclined at the table. And we're going to find out that there's other Pharisees that are there uh, with this lunch or this dinner uh, with Jesus. So it's just not the Pharisee and Jesus. The disciples are not mentioned, so we're going to assume that the disciples are not there. We're going to assume that Jesus is by himself in the company of Pharisees. So a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went and reclined at the table. He didn't sit at the table. Back then, at, at that time, they had a table, and you kind of reclined as you ate. So he's reclining uh, as he's eating. And so they're thinking that um, this is going to be, Pharisees think this is going to be a great time there in control. But the first thing that the Pharisee notices about Jesus is the Pharisee was astonished or amazed to see that he, meaning Jesus, did not first wash his hands before dinner. They were amazed. They were astonished. They were disappointed. They were shocked. This is in a negative way, not in a positive way. Many times in our culture, and we invite somebody over and uh, they don't wash their hands, we may be astonished or amazed because of hygiene, because of germs, or because that's our custom. It has nothing to do with any ceremonial uh, cleansing, any spiritual matter. We're looking at the physical. But in this case here, they, although they may look at the germs physically in a way, they were more concerned about the ceremonial cleansing, meaning that there was a, uh, a oral law that was passed down from a Pharisee and passed down from generation to generation. There was an oral law that was created that was passed down and passed down and passed down and incorporated into their culture and customs and traditions that you had to wash your hands or have your hands baptized before you ate. It wasn't initially started because of a hygiene. That might have been a side benefit, but it was done for a ceremonial washing to keep yourself clean before God. Meaning that uh, in this case here, they were astonished about Jesus because Jesus had spoken to the crowds. He had touched many people. He was a touchy. He just did not go and didn't shake hands or didn't hug or whatever they did back then. 
and he may have touched a Gentile. And if he touched a Gentile, that meant his hands were unclean and they needed to be ceremonially washed to make him clean again. Or he may have touched an object that was deemed to be unclean and therefore his hands needed to be washed. Now this oral law, I said earlier, was uh, created by the Pharisees and passed down. So this was not passed uh, was not part of the Levitical law or Moses law. There was something that was added later that's not included in the Old Testament. So in, re in honesty, in real, to be blunt, Jesus was not bound by this man-made law. This was a man-made law. It was not a law made by God. And so, but they were astonished by it to see that he first did not wash his hand before dinner. Okay? And then it says here, and the Lord said to them, now, you Pharisees, somehow Jesus picked up on it. They didn't say they were uh, upset or disturbed, but they were astonished. And I'm assuming that they were astonished, although they did not say anything, their body language may have given clues to their chagrin, to their surprise, or the facial expressions of shock that Jesus didn't wash his hands was written all over their face, and Jesus picked up on it. Or maybe Jesus just simply read their minds, or, or what I think uh, may have happened in addition to what I've talked about, Jesus purposely did not wash his hands as to stir up the Pharisees to what he's about to say. In other words, he didn't wash his hands knowing that it was going to upset them, knowing that it was going to provoke them, knowing that they would have a response, and that would give him a chance to say what he's about to say here. Okay? Okay. So don't think this was some type of action. This was part of the plan. So the Pharisees, are, to me, they think they're going to have the conversation with Jesus. But we'll see here, it's Jesus that takes control of the conversation. It's Jesus that's going to issue warnings and chastisements and denunciations to them. And they're going to be caught totally off guard. The Pharisees were astonished to see that Jesus did not first wash his hands Wash before dinner, having the water pour over his hands. And the Lord, picking him up on this, I'm adding to that, said this to them, or to him, Now you Pharisees, in other words, listen you Pharisees, I'm talking to you. Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup, of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. Another law that they added to what the Pharisees were, when they would drink out of a cup or eat out of a bowl, not only did they clean the inside of it, they cleaned the outside of it for the sake of a Gentile or unclean person would have touched that cup or bowl. So they were making sure that not only were the inside clean, but the outside was clean also. And so Jesus is going to chastise them for this. He says, you clean the outside of the cup of the dish. He's not saying that's wrong or anything, but on the inside, you are full of greed and wickedness. And so his, his analogy is this. You're worried about the outside of the cup being clean in your life, meaning the rituals, the ceremonial washes, following all the traditions, all the man-made laws. You want to be clean and pure, undefiled physically, but you're neglecting on what's happening on the inside of you, inside that cup. Inside that cup, it's full of greed and wickedness. Greed and wickedness. And so uh, when he says greed and wickedness, the greed talks about the Pharisees were dishonest. When he talks about wickedness, they were immoral. They were dishonest with the people. They were uh, immoral with the people. They were hypocrites. They pretended to be one way when they were another way. Their motives for doing anything for the people was because of self-gain and some type of wickedness or praise to them. Maybe when they fed the poor, uh, it wasn't really to help the poor. It was maybe to make them look good and make them receive praises on how holy they are. Maybe when they prayed out loud, it wasn't that they were praying for people or really praying to God. 
Maybe it was to make themselves receive all the praise and all the attention and all the, uh, yo, you pray so well. Maybe that was part of it. Maybe it was to make themselves look good. So when they say greed and wickedness, they were doing things for self gain, to receive attention, to get all the praise, to rob something that was owed from God and to put it on them. They were held in high esteem and they loved the attention that they received. And so they did it for greed, to receive things, and the, the attention and all that kind of stuff. They did it for wickedness, to immorality. They were hypocrites. What they seemed like they were doing it for was not really the reason. And so that's why Jesus can say they were full of greed and wickedness. And you and I, we don't like uh, hypocrisy or hypocritical people. Uh, we know people that do things for the wrong reason, uh, do things to get attention, do things so their name can be on the list, uh, give a certain amount of money so they can be at the top of the list or near the top of the list, or maybe they help somebody who's poor to make themselves look good, or maybe they use big fancy words to sound impressive to impress people. We don't like those type of people. We Those people are hypocrites, and God feels the same way. And these people are doing things that look good for the wrong reason. They believe that if I do good things, I'll win the favor of God. If I do the good things, God will declare me righteousness. But the problem is they think God looks on the outward outwardness of, of them. But God is really most concerned about what's on the inside. The genuineness on the inside decides whether you will stand right with God. And we'll find that out here. It says, you fools. What's a fool? That's an unwise person, a person who can be deemed ignorant. Doesn't mean they're not smart. Doesn't mean they're dumb. It means concerning to the things of God, they are ignorant. Concerning to the spiritual nature of God's kingdom, they are unwise. They don't have a clue of what God expects from them. They don't have a clue of what it means to please God. They just know what they know. They know what the world know. So therefore, they are ignorant of the things of God. That's what a fool is. Does it mean they can't be a doctor? They can't be a lawyer? They can't be this, this, and that? It means from the things of God, they don't have a clue about. All right? It says, you fools. It says, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? And what he's saying is that, going back to that cup analogy, the person who made the outside of the cup also made the inside. And the analogy is this, the illustration is this, God who made the outside of you that you're trying to keep so clean and trying to please, he also made the inside of you, which you should try just as hard to make clean so that you can please God. That's what he's saying. He's saying that God is more important, more concerned about what's on the inside than he is on the outside. He's saying that God does care about the physical part of you, but he's more concerned about the spiritual part of you because that's what really matters. There's no need to have a cup that's clean on the outside and that's dirty on the inside because that cup cannot be used. In other words, it's no good to be ritually clean on the outside and have your heart full of greed and wickedness on the inside because God, that, that does not please God. That doesn't give you right standing with God. That's what he's saying here. Okay. It says, let me read it again. I just like it. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside? They thought that, that God only was concerned about on the outside, or they thought they can fool God like they were fooling everybody else. And that's what happened there. They thought they could fool God. And God no, God cares about going on the inside. And we have to understand that when we do things for, uh, in, in the name of God, we have to make sure we have the right motives. We got to make sure we do it for the right reason. There are many philanthropists out there in the world today that seem like they're doing a lot. They give a lot of money to this, a lot of money to that. They donate their time to that. But what's the real reason why they're doing it? Are they doing it so they look good? So they can have the name in the paper? So they can get all the praise? So they can build a legacy? Are they, are they, are they, are they really Christians who are doing it to please God? Because God commands us to take care of the needy, the poor, 
those who need clothes, those who don't have shelter, those who are impoverished, those who are suffering. Are we doing it for the right reason? So if we're singing, if we're in the choir stand, are we singing for the right reason? If we're preaching, are we preaching for the right reason? If we're teaching, are we teaching, are we ushering for the right reason? Are we hospitalizing? being hospitable for the right reason in the church? Are we in the opposition of deacon or elder? Are we in those positions for the right reasons? So we have to ask ourselves, are we leading ministries for the right reason? All right, so let's see what else he says here. Look what he says here. He says, but, I mean, in contrast to this, give as alms or gives as gifts those things that are within. Okay, you're worried about the ceremonial Washing the outward, give something from the heart to something from within, and behold, everything is clean for you. Don't get preoccupied in the ceremonial cleansing. Don't think that's going to save you or make you or make you really clean before God. He says, do things from the heart. Do uh, give your gifts from the heart, and behold, you you will be clean. What you do on the outside doesn't make you clean. Jesus is saying what you do on the inside will make you clean. And you don't have to worry about all these ceremonial rituals and washings and things like that. Just do what you do from the heart with the right motive. Meaning that do it out of a love for God. Do it out of a pleasing for God. And behold, everything will be clean for you. You will be, you will, that cleaning, that, that you will be cleansed or be in right standing before God, okay? And I'm not saying that doing things, you can earn your salvation, but it's like James says, faith without works is dead. Your works and what you do and the reason why you do it give evidence to your faith in God, to give evidence that you have a relationship with God. The Pharisees were hypocritical. They did things for the wrong reason and that gave evidence that they had no relationship with God. All right, let's see what he says on verse 42. He's, he's contrasting, but woe to you Pharisees. He says, look at you Pharisees. In contrast to you, woe to you for warning to you Pharisees. Bad news to you Pharisees. For you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. It said, instead of being clean, I'm saying woe to you, warning to you, pity you, unfortunate you. You tithe, they were, the Pharisees were great tithers. They tithe off of everything. They went even beyond what the law required. They overextended the law. They added things and added things to become more and more righteous before God. And those things that they added had no abearance or no weight in their standing before God, but it made them look good. They fasted, they looked sad, they prayed, they prayed out loud so people could hear. They tied and let and let people know how much they gave. They they did rituals and let people think how holy they were. And here we're talking about tithing and tithing is important, but tithing doesn't make you holy. Tithing is something we ought to do, we should do, but tithing in and of itself is not going to make you have right standing before God. There are people out there that can that will live any kind of way and write a big check to the church. There are people that will give a lot of money to the church and think they control the church. There are people that are writing a big check to the church and think they own the pastor or can tell the church what to do or can threaten the church and you don't do what I want, I'm going to withdraw my giving. Uh, I remember at a church, uh, fortunately, that I pastored and um, what they did to the pastor before me, if they didn't like what he did or he went from two services to one service, th then the people that they, they didn't, they passively withheld they're giving to the church in order to protest what the pastor did and to hurt him some kind of way. And we have people that do that today all the time. All churches all over America. All of they do that. And so, but so tithing in of itself doesn't mean you're in right standing with God. 
is what people who are in right standing with God do. It's part of what they do, but it in itself does not make you holy or make you righteous before God. But it is important because God wants us to give. This is Jesus was still under the, uh, when he came, the Old Testament law was still in effect. So tithing was there. Today we're under grace giving. We give from the heart. We give according to our ability. We give cheerfully and we give it voluntarily. And our cheerfulness and giving voluntarily and giving best to our ability should exceed the tithe of the Old Testament because we are over under grace and grace far exceeds the law. It does what the law could not do. All right? Okay. It says, uh, but woe to you Pharisees, you tithe mint. Mint was the mint that we put in our tea, a little leaf. It had little value, very little value, if any. It was a it flavored food. It was a plant. In fact, this mint, this rue, and these herbs that Jesus is talking about, they were not even required by the Old Testament to tithe upon. In the Old Testament, the law says you tithe on the grain, you tithe on the oil, and you tithe on the wine. Those were the three major groups that you tithe upon. Everything else did not matter. This was of no value, but making themselves appear to be holy or being legalistic, they tied on even down to the mint, to the rule, which was another shrub or plant. They had a strong scent to it. And then they even tied on the herbs, the vegetables that weren't even required. And they did that to make themselves look good or to figure that they can buy their way into or give their way into heaven or to having the approval of God. But the problem is they gave for the wrong reason. How do we know that? Because they neglected justice and the love of God. Two people they, they neglected. They neglected humanity and they neglected God himself. Meaning that although they were big tithers, they did nothing for the justice of those who were impoverished, those were in need. They did. They were not an advocate for them. They did not stand up for them. They did not try to help them in a meaningful way. They neglected them. They left them right where they are uh, in poverty, under injustice. When something was done wrong to them, it was no advocacy for them. When they needed a helping hand, they were not there. They neglected the justice of man, of humanity, and they neglected the love of God. They did what they did out of selfish ambition, selfish praise. They did not do what they did, the tithing, the rituals, the, the giving, the this and that. They didn't do it out of the love of God. They neglected the love of God. And what God is telling us is that what we need to do, an evidence that we are on the right track, evidence that we are in right standing for God is how we treat those in need, the, the orphan, the widow, the, uh, the alien, how we treat those, how we treat the single parent mother, the homeless person, the mentally ill person, the person in prison, the person whose society has forgotten about. And then we, ask, then we have to also, uh, do we neglect the love of God? Do we do things out of the love of God or we do things out of the love of ourselves? That's what we have to ask ourselves, okay? The work is not what's going to save us, but the work is going to give evidence of what's in our heart and whether or not we're in right standing for God. That's what Jesus is saying here, okay? This is, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others, okay? It says, uh, he said, you should have done these things. You, yeah, tithe. But don't tithe and neglect those in need. And don't tithe and neglect God. They were hypocrites. They were imposters. They were impersonators of godly people. No part of God was in them. They were hypocrites. And Jesus takes this time to issue a warning to them, to chastise them, to put them in their place. And when he says, whoa, this is one of three woes, there are six woes in this section, we're covering three. Uh, Jesus is taking the Pharisee off his high horse 
and put him in a place where he needs to be, one of self-evaluation, one in need of repentance, one in need of having their sins forget, forgiven. They felt they were doing all the right things. They had no need for their sins to be forgiven. They knew they were in right standing for God, and God is saying, you are far from it. Okay? He says, none of the second woe. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogue. The best seat in the synagogue was the front seat facing the congregation. So these Pharisees sat next to the speaker. Speaker may have been a Pharisee too, and or the priest. And as he read scripture, they were looking at the congregation. And so when you sit in the front seat, you're sitting in a place of honor. These Pharisees were escorted to the front seat and people saw them being escorted and it gave them a sense of honor, attention, the praise that they were craving for. And then they looked in the, they sat in the front seat. They had the opportunity to gaze at the congregation and the congregation, congregation gazed at them and held them in high esteem. And that's what they wanted most, honor and praise to be held in high esteem, to look up to as one who is holy and righteous before God. And so they crave that, okay? And uh, it says, and I'm going to give you a story. I was at a member of a church, and a great church, blessed church, and but uh, the issue was the pastor was sitting in the middle, and all these associate ministers, myself included, I was not, I didn't do what they did, but they were all scrambled to sit next to him so they could be seen as close to this famous, popular, great pastor. They wanted to sit next to him because the closer they sat next to him, people would look at him as if they were better connected to him than the other people. The farther away you sat from him meant you have a lesser relationship the closer you sat to him, felt that you were the right-hand person. You were close with that person. You were, some of his righteousness was rubbing off on you. And and, and when I was young, in, in that minute, I was young in there, I wasn't no staff or anything like that, but people people uh, raced to sit next to him. They, uh, at one person, it was not enough seats, and he took a seat from the from the uh, congregation to put up there so he could be sitting in the, in the um, in the pulpit, so he could be seen. Uh, this uh, the service was videotaped. It was all this, so you could be seen. And so it happens. Uh, it happened back then. It happens today. And one thing, if you're in ministry or if you're serving, it, it takes you have to be humble. You have to be disciplined. You have to make sure that your heart is right when you're serving. You're not doing it for attention because in the end. That's going to be your reward. And when you stand before God, he's going to say, get away from me. I never knew you. And the reason why is because you did all the things for the wrong reason. You gave, you proved that you had no relationship with God. You proved that. And so uh, the, these Pharisees wanted to sit in the best seat to be seen, to be revered, to be looked upon. And, and a lot of people preach for that reason. A lot of people teach for that reason. People usher for that reason. People sing in the choir for that reason. We do things for the attention for, to us and not to God. And we have to be careful about that. It's a great temptation. And, and let me give you this other part they talk about, another temptation out there too. It says, ingredients in the marketplace. Another place, these Pharisees were popular. They were seen up front, so people recognized them. And so when they were in the, rock, in the marketplace, the, the people would say, Hi, uh, Reverend so and so. Hi, Pastor so and so. Uh, just uh, acknowledging them, revering them publicly. And they ate that up too. They loved it. And let me give you a story too. And, what a, and it's a temptation to all pastors. Uh, to myself included, when you get that type of attention, it can be hard to deal with when you don't get it or, or when you do receive it. I was part of a very large church on staff, great church, popular pastor. His popularity rubbed off on all the, all the other associate ministers because he was well known. We became well known because we were part of a large church and we set up in the pulpit. We became known. It was just a natural progression. Nothing wrong with that. But uh, uh, I know myself, when I would go to the grocery store, I would go someplace, and even today, I've been away from that church for about almost 10, 10 years, um, 
I still can go to grocery stores or places and people still recognize me and shout out Reverend Wilson or Pastor Wilson. And you have to be careful not to want to hear those words or not to get big headed when you do it. You, you have to make yourself or will yourself or pray and ask God to keep you humble because it can, buy, it can do something to you. It can send you down the wrong path when people are always See, you go everywhere you go and they're recognizing you and acknowledge you and revering you and all that stuff. You've got to stay humble and you've got to appreciate the, the acknowledgement in a humble way, but not in a way where you get puffed up, arrogant, and where you're wanting the praise. It's out there. It is a struggle. I'm not denying that. But, you get, but the more in touch you're with God, the more you have God in your heart, the more within is right, the better you can handle the, the situation. These Pharisees were leaders. They were out front in the church. They were revered. They were in a position and they couldn't handle it. They were in it for the wrong reason and not the right reason. And that's here there. Okay. So they were greetings in the marketplace. They loved that. They relished that. They loved that attention. And Jesus is saying, woe to you. For serving for the wrong for the wrong reason. Woe to you! Your heart is not right. You're greedy, and you're and you're wicked, meaning that you want all this attention, and you're wicked because you're a hypocrite. And that's why we don't want to be hypocrites, and we don't want to be greedy for attention. The attention goes to God. The attention and the reason why we serve is at God's pleasure, under His mercy and grace. All right. Then the last woe. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. The people, the Jewish people of that time, they were with the dead, was to walk over a dead grave was to make yourself unclean. And so when the graves, when they were walking down a certain path, people would come in and wash the whitewash the grave so that you can know it that was a grave of an individual so that you can go around it okay but the problem came is when the grave was not whitewashed when it wasn't identified as a grave people walked over these graves making themselves unclean or defiled in their mind without even knowing it okay and that's what happened here so what Jesus is saying here for you are like unmarked graves the Pharisees Unmarked graves defiled people, okay? And people walk over them. I mean, people follow you without even knowing that you are defiled and that by following them, they are becoming defiled also, or unclean also. In other words, you are leading people astray down the wrong path, down the path of defilement and uncleanness. That's what he's saying. Your ministry is, is leading people astray. They're watching you and they're thinking that this is the way it ought to be. This is the way I should walk. And instead of you bringing them closer to God, you are bringing them away from God. Instead of making them clean or undefiled, you are making them defiled and unclean. That's what he's saying. Woe to you. There's three other roles. These, these, these woes here, when we talk about to the Pharisees. The other woes are going to be to the scribes. And hopefully we'll cover that at a later time. But this passage here speaks to us. we got to make sure that we're not hypocritical. Just because you go to church every Sunday, just because you give, just because you sing in the choir, all those, all those good things doesn't mean you're in right standing with God. If your heart is not right, God cares about the inside. We need to spend more time working on the inside than we do on the outside. We spend a lot of time adorning ourselves. Fancy clothes, the right head, the right shoes, and all those type of things. And we have to ask ourselves, are we spending that same type of uh, time and effort even more working on the inside, working on our anger, our jealousy, our greediness, our wickedness, our immorality, uh, the way we covet things, the way we want things, the things that we struggle with, our eyes, our way our eyes look, what comes out of our mouth. Are we spending that much time to make sure that we're clean and pleasing to God on the inside? Are we, are we doing that? Are we spending too much time that so we can look good 
in front of other people, look good on Sunday, look good on Bible study when we're all messed up on the inside. Well, I hope something that I said today has helped you in a meaningful way. I hope that it helps you in your preparation for study or it helps you somehow if you're a student. Um, it has blessed me tremendously. We need to check ourselves every so often. Uh, we all have this pharisaical type of attitude with us. And if we're not right with God or not close with God, or we're not pouring into our spirit with God's word and praying, meditation, and all those type of disciplines, then we can easily drift off into where it's all about us and not about God. That's what we have to fight against. God bless you. Love you much. Have a great Sunday. Have a great Sunday school. We'll talk again next week.